Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our program, Remembering the Lexington Ladies, 1769 Spinning Tableau, part of the Lex Seher Speaker Series. My name is Helen Liu and I am the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation, whose support enables us to bring programs like today's event to you. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. Uh, if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat. I would like to introduce our moderator today, Jesse Steigerwald, who will then introduce our guest for today, Sarah McDonough from the Lexington Historical Society. Jesse Steigerwald is the president of Lex Seher Incorporated. Her professional career has centered around two lifelong passions, advocacy and education. She was elected to town meeting in 2008 and school committee in 2009. She has supported partnerships between parents and schools, encouraged community engagement, and found creative ways to solve problems. In 2013, Jesse was appointed to the Lexington Council for the Arts. She then joined Lexington's 300th anniversary, the fun twister, town celebration committee, and served as a co-chair for events. She coordinated multiple events and wrote and directed the production of Breaches, Bloomers, and Bell Bottoms, Oh My, celebrating the past 300 years of textiles and fashion in Lexington. At the conclusion of the tercentennial, Jesse wrote the book, We Are Lexington, celebrating 300 years. Jesse is originally from Staten Island, New York. She studied American history and visual uh, American History and Visual and Environmental Studies at Harvard College, graduating in 1990 and graduated from Cornell Law School with a concentration in advocacy in 1993. Jesse, welcome. Thank you so much, Helen, and thank you to Cary Library and the Foundation for making today's event possible. Um, today is actually August 31st, 2022, so it is literally the 253rd anniversary of the spinning protests that will be the focus of Lex Seher's speaker series today. And we're really excited to have it be on the day of the event, something we'll discuss in our conversation. I'm very excited to welcome and introduce Sarah McDonough. Hello, Sarah. Hi, thanks for having me. Sarah is Programs Manager at Lexington Historical Society and has been there for many years and has helped introduce and expand and help people connect with Lexington's history. Um, we're excited to talk about education today as well as how we build community through our interpretation of the past. So very glad to continue our ongoing conversation, Sarah. Um, how is it feeling? Let's just start out with being the actual anniversary of a date of an event that you have spent a lot of time studying. Um, it feels good to be able to talk about it again. Um, obviously Lexington loves its anniversaries and this is not one that in previous years has been a regular occurrence uh, for people to think of. And particularly because we tend to do our reenactments on the weekends, it's nice to be thinking about anniversaries on the actual day rather than a few days before or after. Now, today's speaker series is going to be a little extra special for those who are here live, but we will be able to record and share this later and invite anyone who's listening to think about the questions we discussed today and email any ideas, suggestions, or thoughts you have. Um, the email address for Lex Seher is lexmonument at gmail.com. I will repeat that later, but you'll see that we've got some information to share up front, a nice surprise to share, and also then we'll be looking for input. Sarah, one of the things we talk about when you and I are planning is how we interpret the past when we have an event for which there's very little data. So before we show our surprise, um, can you help us understand what is the primary source that tells us this event actually happened? Yeah, so there's very little. Um, as you said, in fact, we even looked through Jonas Clark's diary, through the minister's diary to see if he mentioned anything about this event. He didn't. Um, I found that very interesting, but there's actually a, an article in the newspaper in, uh, I believe, October of 1769. So it actually took a couple of months to get this, get the word out um, that this was happening. And just a couple of paragraphs um, explaining that the women were there from sun up to sundown, how much they spun, and Many of these articles were really just trying to get other people to join in 
this movement. And so, as you can see in the second paragraph, they're really pushing for other people to acknowledge that this was an important action and to sort of guilt trip other communities into being as patriotic as Lexington. It's fascinating that there is this one mention and, you know, it says very early in the morning, the young ladies of this town to the number of 45 assembled at the house of Mr. Daniel Harrington with their spinning wheels where they spent the day in the most pleasing satisfaction and at night presented Mrs. Harrington with a spinning of 602 knots of linen and 546 knots of cotton. If any should be inclined to treat such assemblies or the publication of them with a contemptuous sneer as thinking them quite ludicrous, such persons would do well to consider what would become one of our much boasted manufacturers on which we pretend the welfare of our country is so much depending. If those of the fair sex should refuse to lay their hands to the spindle or be unwilling to hold the distaff. So let's set the stage a little bit. There's a year before town meeting takes a vote and there's a decision that Lexington is gonna to lean towards refusing to give in to what they saw as unfair tariffs and taxes. Can you help us set the stage? Sure, so this is getting into about four years into what I would consider to be the American Revolution. Um, the taxation really took off in terms of protests around 1765 um, with the Stamp Act. And there were several other series of taxes as the government realized that people were protesting, started removing some taxes, adding more, seeing basically what people would handle. Um, each time there was an increasing sense of, we have the ability to tax you, don't forget about that. Um, with the Americans, on the other hand, saying we will pay a tax as long as we have agreed to it. It's the principle of the thing. And 1769 was sort of a, a culmination year where these acts were starting to snowball a little bit. And so the protests were growing, becoming more broad, um, as well as more common because more and more things were being taxed at the same time. So as I said, we have a small surprise. Now this is the kind of surprise present that's handmade and so it's not quite finished, but um, we're such a loving community and it's such a special day. I do wanna share a short video. Think of it, if you will, as a trailer of what's to come in a um, situation where we have more time for editing. Our reenactment this year took place on Saturday, which is just a couple of days ago. So it will take more time to edit all of that footage and put in all the photos. But I do want to go ahead and share screen. Um, once I press play, if anyone is listening, can raise your hand to let me know you're hearing the sound. That would be great. And once I know everyone's hearing it, we can enjoy it. It's just a couple minutes, uh, just a taste of one interpretation of um, yeah. This special event we'll be discussing okay. today. All right.
free hazard for this great <laughs> and we're just so grateful. It took more than 65 people to have Saturday's tableau come to bear, come to being. Um, so I want to just mention here a couple thank yous from Lex Sear. Not only did Lexington Historical Society collaborate, LexArt also collaborated this year, bringing additional spinners both to the site of Anna's home and also over to the visitor center lawn. So lots of people could come and try out spinning, which we'll talk about in our time together this morning. Also, First Parish Church actually owns that property at 3 Harrington Road, which was Anna Harrington's homestead. And so we're really grateful that they allowed us for the second year um, for Let's See Her and the third time to allow the spinning to take place right there on, on her homestead. That's very special. In addition, what you saw this year with all those hats and beautiful aprons was made possible by a very generous grant from the Community Endowment of Lexington. And it's been a wonderful summer with more than 12 weeks of community members, some who never met before, coming out to our summer sew along series. Um, it's a bit of a tongue twister there too. And during these sessions, people were able to hand sew linen aprons in a style that people would have worn. We're also gonna talk about textiles today. So just wanted to get those thank yous out there and for every volunteer who spent part of this extremely hot summer sewing. For me, Sarah, that set the stage of getting my mind to think about what was it like for these 45 women in Lexington? And let's talk a little bit about, you know, this video is an interpretation, our event is an interpretation, but it seems reasonable to think that in a, in a small community with fewer than a thousand people, if 45 ladies gathered together, there was months of planning going into this. And I know you did research to help us understand and document what was going on with Captain Parker. So can you share that connection with us and help us think about the months leading up to this event? Sure, so first of all, as you mentioned, that's a large percentage of the population. Um, when you consider trying to figure out the number of households that might've been in Lexington at the time, the majority of the town's population of you know, 800 or so is going to be children in this time period. Most families are gonna have, you know, somewhere between a half a dozen to a dozen children. And so the number of women who are, have the leisure time to be able to do something like this is not incredibly great. So the fact that 45 of them were able to do this says a lot about their dedication. And the other important thing about this movement in this type of area is that Lexington is a suburban, community even by 18th century standards. It's kind of out in the country, but we have a really direct connection to Boston through the Great Road or the Bay Road, what's now Mass Ave. So we have shops, we have traveling peddlers, we can get fine imported goods, we can get goods that are made in other larger towns uh, like Salem perhaps, uh, very easily. And so the idea of everyone in the 18th century making everything that they own from scratch is sort of a myth that we have about these self-sufficient pioneers where if you have a dozen kids and a farm to raise, um, you're not gonna have time to constantly be spinning and weaving and sewing. If you had the means you were gonna go to a store, if you're gonna be spinning, you're gonna be making utilitarian objects, it was, not necessarily a lost or dying art, it was just not an art that was really necessary for everyone here in town. And so we do have quite a bit of information about the lead up to this event in the form of uh, John Parker's account books. Um, captain Parker from, well, he wasn't captain yet, um, was um, 
the town's wheel right. So anything that would have been made uh, with wheels, you know, wagon wheels mainly, but spinning wheels was was part of that. He would be the repairman and also the person to make new items for you. And we still have in our collection all of his accounts where he writes down who he's making things for, where they live, what type of items, whether it's a repair, whether it's a new job, um, how much it cost. And so we can see the numbers start to go up and up and up in the late 1760s as people are mainly getting like their grandparents sewing and spinning and weaving equipment from uh, the attic or the basement and realizing that they need to use them again, uh, in some cases relearning how to use them for this purpose. And I think that's a really fun piece of sort of visual history as you can track more and more people getting involved. Um, Captain Parker also lived on the Waltham line. Um, and so a lot of his clients were from out of town as well, which is very interesting. I personally haven't uh, gone searching yet to find out how big of a patriotic spirit Waltham had at the time, um, but it would be really interesting to start digging even further into the surrounding communities as well. Which is a really important connection for people listening to this. Lexi here has a research team and as Sarah showed you, that one piece of newspaper is kind of the primary source that mentions the spinning. But by looking at things like Captain Parker, then John Parker's revenue diary, his like business accounts, it's another primary source that can help us think about not just what was this event like or how long were people planning for it, but also who was at this event. Right now, it's still, it's unknown. These women are anonymous to us. Um, but if you think about yourself, if we think about ourselves, anytime the town has a big event, whether it's the 300th anniversary or the Patriots Day reenactment, people in town start talking about it far in advance. There's always someone new each year that even if they live here, they've never had a chance to get involved before. So things then travel the same way by word of mouth. So the video is showing women hearing about and talking about the news of the day. When you describe for us, the different ways that people are hearing about things that they felt were unfair. Um, the society has done a great job bringing forward the tea burning. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Because many people didn't know about Lexington's tea burning even 10 years ago. Yeah, um, we're, we're constantly, you know, digging into new histories here. Um, and so personally for me, I started looking at these things as we were heading into Revolution 250. And a lot of the early events that we did were focusing on these protests, uh, particularly the Stamp Act. So the first reenactment, the first anniversary event that I went to was actually planning for the Stamp Act. So that was 2014. Um, so it's been going on for quite some time. And I think it's really important to keep women's history in there as we're heading towards the more sort of battle focused anniversaries. Um, what's really important to me is to remember that the revolution was always a community effort and that it didn't start, the, the revolution didn't start in 1775 or 1776. Um, that was sort of a, in some ways the ending of Rev 250 uh, to think about um, locally in terms of that was the culmination point, but it was building for so many years. So we've been doing a lot of digging and then certainly people in the revolutionary time would have been talking because we are central. Um, and so I do, I sort of wonder as we were just saying, how many of those 45 women may have been from Waltham who were just talking to the Parkers were getting their spinning wheels set up and thinking, well, Lexington seems to really have their act together. Uh, with this protest, we should join in. Maybe they formulated their own later, maybe not, but Lexington seemed very organized about it. And particularly with Anna Harrington being at the forefront of all of this, she lives right on the town common at a major juncture in the road, um, the road to Boston, the road to Bedford, and the road to Concord. And so that would have been highly visible for everyone and really the perfect place to um, to show off. 
I always think it's very important to understand the past by thinking about similar things that happen today because humans are humans across time. So I'm thinking about a, a beloved woman in town named Shirley Lane, who was part of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And every year they had a yard sale and people from different places came to put their stuff in this yard sale because she lived on a main thoroughfare right near the center of town. Easy to find, easy to pull up and have a quick parking spot while you jump out for the yard sale. And it may seem a little bit mundane in some ways, but the things you described fit perfectly with the way humans interact in a community. I love what you're sharing about the battle because the battle is an incredibly important chapter in American history, but we know the men didn't arrive that day and suddenly become brave. There had been years of frustration, years of aggravation, years of feeling like this is just not fair. We're working so hard here in Massachusetts and too much of our energy is going into profiting people overseas. So it's really important to think about it. Now, um, Dr. Emily Murphy, Stacey Frazier, Mary Fuhrer have all also added research that we can look to to understand what is the frame of mind of women in the community even if we don't have diaries or letters and the kinds of things you're describing, just like today, we read the headline news, you know, people have their positions about political things or environmental things or economic things. And women are no different then. They couldn't vote, they couldn't hold office, but they still had opinions. Now we know that things like casting your tea off or burning your tea or saying, fine, we won't import any more linens, those had bigger impacts on women's daily lives because they had to go figure it out. So with the T, the exhibit that's up at the society right now, which I highly encourage people, if you haven't gone or if you've gone, you should go again. Before the something must be done, Bold Women of Lexington exhibit closes to make space for a new exciting exhibit about textiles, um, make sure to go over there. You have in there a nice box um, that puts different kinds of herbs in there. What is that about? Why are, why are women so interested in herbs after the tea burning? I think it's important for people to have their rituals, to have their comforts and trying to, you know, make do in a difficult situation. It both allows you to feel more normal in a time of crisis, but it also makes a point. Lexington was definitely a more politically radical town than most others in the area. Um, we know that a lot of other towns that were sort of a little farther away from Boston who didn't have a minister who was cousin to a major radical politician uh, did not have the same types of protests and concerns that we did. Um, but similarly to wearing homespun clothing, um, as I tell people in the museum nowadays, we perhaps wear clothing that has a political slogan on it that gives a sense of what you believe. They didn't have screen printing back then, but you could tell someone's political belief at the time of the revolution based on the quality and the makeup of their clothing. If they're wearing something that's made out of imported silk very proudly, then that might be someone who doesn't care uh, about the tariffs. And if you are someone who is very consciously wearing homespun clothing, then that could be making a point as well. And tea goes along with that. As you are serving tea to your friends and family, you're sending a political message based on whether or not you're serving real tea or an herbal tea. Um, in Lexington, again, it's hard to tell how much of an impact that would make because so many people were in agreement on this, but in other towns, it would have been fairly radical. And it was something that was you know, on a lot of people's minds, uh, I know, uh, John Adams mentions it in his diary uh, at some point around this time going to uh, a house he was, you know, riding the circuit as a lawyer and asked for tea uh, at, at an inn and the woman looked at him like he had three heads and says, we're not doing that. We're a patriot household. And he said, just smuggle it like a normal person. I drink smuggled tea. <laughs> um, so there, there are many layers to that. So I wanted to share a photograph up close so we can talk a little bit more about what people wear. This is a photograph from your 2019 event where uh, you first organized bringing this event back to light. So um, briefly, because we have talked about this uh, in a different, a different discussion, but if you can just tell us, you, you set the stage for the 2019 event 
And then we'd love to take a closer look at, at what you wore to the protest, so to speak. Sure, so 2019 is really when all of this started because it was the 250th anniversary of the actual event. And so it was a very different venture from the Lex See Her event, which is a very sort of symbolic, metaphorical uh, type of presentation. And initially, it was a very uh, large, uh, probably larger than it should have been scale undertaking to try and figure out, can we do a physical recreation of this? And I realized very quickly that finding 45 people who both have 18th century reproduction spinning wheels and clothing and know how to use them is quite difficult. Um, but that I think works to our advantage because we could have more context put into place for the event. So in, at the end of the day, we had um, perhaps a dozen people who had spinning wheels, both 18th century and um, modern, different types of wheels. Um, as you can see, my colleague, uh, Sue in the background of this one with a, a great wheel um, used to uh, for cotton. And we also had other people in the community who could speak more to the political impact. So there were folks there that just knew the art of spinning, not as much about the history, people who could speak to both, and then folks who were explaining how the community would have gathered around these women. Um, because it was also a social event. It was a way for everyone to come out, even if they weren't physically participating in the protest, but to be supportive and to show their political colors to anyone who might be on the road. And we can see that here. We can see the smaller spinning wheel up front and then in the back, I'm just gonna zoom in so people don't miss it, this standing wheel. And again, people who are able to go to Buckman Tavern up to that second floor exhibit space, you can see examples uh, directly and really get a closer look and start imagining. I know I did a sketch, a conceptual sketch for last year's tableau. And as you say, a tableau is, uh, it's an artistic effort to show something. Everyone doesn't have spinning wheels. As you saw in the video, people were spinning umbrellas, which was a happy uh, happy accident, I think, would be the way Bob Ross would put it, the painter, um, or Gene Hart in town uses that phrase, because we were thinking about how do we have a rain or shine event, and umbrellas seem really helpful, and you can spin them, so that's how we ended up with umbrellas for Lex Seher. But we did want to build on what you'd done and really try to convey, while we worked on the monument project, what is the significance of 45 women coming out? It's very impactful, and it's a lot of people in the community who seem to be on the same page more than four years before the battle. Um, big deal. So I want to take a closer look here at your hat and just then I'll pop this off. But for uh, for this year, part of the Community Endowment of Lexington's grant was used to build a collection. We now have a, a permanent collection, if you will, of 45 appropriate hats and aprons and caps so that when we're out, we can more easily picture the past and really start thinking about it. But there's quite a bit of politics here in this hat. And as you said, we spent a lot of time thinking about how will we trim these hats? Will we use silk? Which at the time women were deciding they would forsake silk and set it aside. It's beautiful. It holds dye really well. Colors were very vibrant. They were not faded back then. People like their pinks and purples, just like we do. But some women would have perhaps taken the silk off their hat and put linen on or something more simple, um, as you said, as a sign that even from a distance in a shop, I might see your hat and I would know where you stood politically. I'm curious when you think about what to wear for one of these events, what kind of thoughts go through your mind about what you'll wear and about what women made as their choices? Yeah, I think what looking at this picture and, and you know trying to think back to that particular day i think what stands out the most is i made a conscious decision not to wear any jewelry um which i normally would i think 18th century clothing a lot of it's in details and accessories in making it look less like a costume and more like something that's integrated um that's the sort of thing as a child of the 90s i grew up wearing chokers 
and people did back then too. That was a very uh, common thing. And they were generally made out of silk ribbon. Now it would have been really easy to get and a difficult decision that I had to make was to think about how much of this would I set aside to make a statement versus how much of it would I keep in my wardrobe because I already have it in my wardrobe. Um, there's something to be said for if I already own this thing, I'm still not giving any extra money to England. I'm not buying any more, but as an 18th century woman, I only have so much in my wardrobe that I can swap out. So for instance, at that point, I didn't have a plain untrimmed hat that I could have worn, but it was very sunny that day and I didn't want to get sunburned. So in my 18th century character, I thought, well, if I only had one straw hat, I would wear it even if it had silk. Might I take that off? Not sure. Um, I did make uh, the decision to wear entirely linen on that day. Um, so I do have nicer uh, quality outfits that I could have worn. Um, nothing that I have is the sort of really rough homespun that they would have used, but you know, making an effort to dress down a little bit and to be a little more plain. Um, but there's always a push and pull. Uh, one of the things that um, Dr. Murphy talked about when she was presenting her research to us was the fact that it's a very specific subset of women who were able to go to an event like this. You can't have 12 children and set aside an entire day uh, to just sit next to a spinning wheel. Um, and so most of the people at these types of events would have been younger women, teenagers, women in their early mid twenties who had the leisure time to be able to do this, which means that if you're sitting there in broad daylight in the center of town trying to show off, there is that push and pull between really wanting to show your politics and also really wanting to show off your looks because it's also a way to meet people and possibly meet boys. And so there, there were things in the newspaper saying, you know, women were not going to date or marry anyone who isn't supporting the boycotts. But on the other hand, do you want to look a little good for this event in case someone interesting walks by? So as, as we start thinking about these things, I think it really brings these people to life even more. They're not just archetypes that we're talking about here as the political protester, as a monolith. These are real women who had to make real decisions and decisions that people still have to make today. And when we think about this, so Lexier is partnering with you and we've decided you know, we're gonna commit to doing this for five years. Maybe it'll keep going because once you do it um, and the bug sort of bites, it's in your head that this is an important event. And this is a specific event that's documented, it's real and it's woman centered. So it's unique among the other um, ways that we can think about the past. I do want to zoom in for people who are taking a look and perhaps will think about joining us next year. Um, this is a beautiful photograph from Jeff Beam who took photographs this weekend. I'm going to just zoom in here on Janet. So you can see Lexi her made the decision out of the 45 hats to make a number of them all linen and then a few of them more fancy and then a bunch in between um, so that we can continue as a community. And that's where I'm going to invite in a few minutes, people who are listening, you know, what do you think? Because you may not have a background in studying American history, but literally what we really have is this paragraph to go on. And then an amazing amount of research that's been done by people like Dr. Murphy, looking at textiles, looking at sketches and paintings and drawings, people really work to become fully informed before they dress up as the past to try to make it as historically accurate as possible. So I just wanted to give this example up here on top. You can see there's a linen band around the hat that Janet Lane is wearing. The other thing I wanna to touch on are the white aprons. So uh, Dr. Murphy, when she spoke with us, talked about the importance of being a credit economy and that people, when they would go into the shops would not be handing over coins and cash. They would be having an account book kept with the merchant that was a series of uh, marks of what they owed and they were buying on credit. And it sounds like the merchants would size you up, look you up and down and see how your clothing looked. Um, can you talk to us just a little bit about the, the white apron and why that color was so important and, and how were merchants sizing you up as a woman? 
Yeah, so cleanliness was really important to people in the 18th century. I think that's another myth that we have about folks in the past that no one ever, ever bathed, that everyone stank, that they were dirty all the time. Um, people were doing an incredible amount of physical labor, of course, um, but they did try very hard to be presentable and they were a much more class conscious society than we are now. Um, if you look at the millionaires of today, they tend to be the ones wearing jeans and t-shirts. Those jeans and t-shirts just happen to cost a thousand dollars each. And so they want to dress down for whatever reason. Uh, in the 18th century, everyone wanted to dress up. You wanted to look better of a better social class than you were. And if you can't afford very good quality fabric, one way that you could show that you were a respectable person was through your body linen. Um, everyone would wear uh, some sort of uh, shirt, undershirt um, underneath your clothing. So for a man, it's just called a shirt. It, you know, it's a shirt. Um, you wear your vest and your uh, coat over it. And for a woman, it was called a shift. And you wear that under the gown. So when you see photos of women in the 18th century, there's usually a little bit of a white cup sticking out of your elbow. And so keeping that clean and presentable. So for a woman having, you know, not having dirt on your cuff, um, you would wear um, a handkerchief around your neck um, to uh, cover your upper chest during the day. Um, for a man, you would have a neck cloth, a cravat, something like that. Um, having that appear very clean and very bright white and nicely bleached and boiled was incredibly important to show your status because it meant that you had more than one of something and that you could swap out every day or multiple times a day if you needed to so that you could always look nicely, nicely clean and presentable. And so an apron was another one of those items that would show your ability to keep clean and to sort of show whether you're wearing an apron because you have to or because you want to. Um, so if you're wearing a dark colored apron or something with a pattern on it, um, that would be more for working because it's not gonna show stains. If you're wearing a white apron, that's gonna get dirty very quickly. So if you're wearing a nice, clean, bright white apron, that basically means I haven't been handling pots and pans with this. Um, I'm very consciously trying to present uh, a clean and uh, bright and sweet smelling and looking appearance. They're so visually striking. I do, I'll share a photograph that was from, um, not, not in the video yet, but this is one of Jeff's photos also. And just the appearance of the different hats with the different styles, you can see here on the right side, Diane is wearing a really fancy bedecked, beautiful beribboned hat. Um, and then we have some simpler hats um, in here and some linen hats, but those white aprons really stood out on Saturday, seeing them all coming together was quite striking. Um, and, you know, we don't know. We've said all the, the year leading up to this event on this past weekend, we don't know. Maybe people were going to a protest and maybe they wore their kitchen apron. It's possible. It's not really what um, Emily has thought, but we're going to keep having talks. Again, thanks to that grant from the Community Endowment of Lexington, we're going to have some other historians joining us over the coming fall and winter months. So as we look to next year, we can just gain other perspectives from different historians who have focused their attention and their professional life on looking at textiles in this time period. So we'd love to just let people know that the Lexington Historical Society's next exhibit at Buckman Tavern is going to focus on textiles from the past as well as from the present. Um, can you just let people know? And while Sarah is sharing this, this is a great time if you have questions or you have opinions or ideas um, about either this year's tableau, about the historic event itself, or ideas for next year. We're really excited to make new friends um, and hear what people have to say. After all, this history belongs to all of us in our community. Yeah, so we're very excited to start changing things out. Um, the current exhibit, Something Must Be Done, went up on the first weekend of March, 2020. So it was not up for very long before the museum closed. And so we've luckily had over a year now for people to be able to come back and to view it. Um, and we are starting to swap things out um, a little bit more frequently. 
So that exhibit is uh, going to be officially ending um, after uh, Monday, um, so right after Labor Day. And then the next exhibit that's going up is called Stitching Stories, uh, Textiles and Conversation. And that is going to be officially opening with the reception on the evening of September 23rd. So if anyone is interested in coming to that, we do have a registration form on our website, which is lexingtonhistory.org, just that we know how many people are coming and how many snacks to get. Um, and that is uh, going to be up for uh, probably about a year. And it is sort of expanding on um, some of the themes uh, from the protests in just how does clothing change through time? And so we have clothing from the mid 18th century through the mid 20th century and kind of tracing some of these uh, families in Lexington and how they um, navigate changing styles and going from making things at home to purchasing things in a shop. Um, the Harrington family is actually one of the families that has given us a lot of material over the years, uh, not so much from Anna herself, um, but from uh, some later generations from the early 19th century. And so it's interesting to track some of these people uh, and these families through time. Um, so it's gonna be mainly fashion focused. The majority of things that are given to museums tend to be people's best clothing, wedding dresses, uniforms, um, baby clothes, things like that. Um, but then we've also been working with contemporary artists who have made pieces based on the theme of textiles or some of the themes surrounding the textiles. And so those are going to be on display both within the exhibit and then also in our period rooms downstairs. It's really exciting. Um, and it it's, uh, leads in really nicely to another part of what Lexi here is doing is called the Put Her on a Map Project. So we have a lovely map that shows what Lexington Center looked like in 1775 in the Ed in the Edward Worthen sorry Edwin Worthen collection at Cary Memorial Library, and uh, we've had permission to use that map so we can trace it and we can a uh, digital copy of the map. No tracing of the actual map has taken place, just to be clear. Um, but to think about this map, which has a showing of where each person lived in 1775. And of course, all of the houses are represented by the name of the man of the house, the men who live there and not the women. So similarly, just like the Boston Gazette article I put up earlier, where it says at the home of Mr. Daniel Harrington, and then later refers to Mrs. Harrington, um, part of the research team effort is to document who lived in these houses, and we're making a database to show how old were the different women in the house on the day of the spending protest. Because we know that article says, quote, young ladies, but we also imagine that women of different ages were there. There were probably girls there as well. Because as you can imagine now, if you pulled together 45 of your friends, they may be of different ages and they might bring people along with them to the event. So this put her on the map project will try so that you could stand there and look around what was the town commons and think about, oh, that person was the sister-in-law of that person. Oh, that person's daughter lived down the street after they got married and try to understand our community relationships a little bit better. So we look forward to continuing that work and anyone is invited to. I do wanna make sure if anyone has questions, I know that thank you so much to Alan for hosting us today. Um, she put that in the chat bar, but we're a small enough group. If you would like to raise your hand, um, we can also hear you if you have questions or comments. What it means to have this belong to our community, Sarah, is so interesting because when we have these untold stories, they don't belong to anybody. So I find one of the most poignant moments is when this year played by Nancy Lattimore, she says, and we know this day will never be forgotten. Um, I'm sure those 45 women who must have looked around at her house and seeing this solidarity among women, this sort of sisterhood feeling in their community that they could do something, they could take an action, they could stand together. Um, it seems like it would be very meaningful for them if in fact the day were not forgotten. <laughs> um, and for so many years, it, it was, that's the reality. So I know I feel very indebted to you and to Lexington Historical Society and everyone who joined you in 2019 
because you brought it to life and you brought it right to the fore. Um, Thank you. So it's just really good. I, I hope that you can feel how much appreciation we have because it is a lot of work to do these events and certainly bringing in people from different communities with spinning wheels is an undertaking. What excites you the most when you're out there and you're imagining that you're portraying Anna, so you're imagining her mindset that day? Um, I think just being able to tell an untold story um, is very important to me. And as, as a museum person, the museum field has always been female dominated, which is not something that most people think about. Um, particularly as I walk through our own museums, so much of the stories that we tell in there have come down through the women. And they're more social stories. Um, folks come to a place like Lexington, again, not for any bad reason to learn about a battle. And I think what we give people is again, that sense that this was a, a community battle that was happening for several years. Um, and that a lot of the memory that was being passed down is coming through the women and they're adding that community context that makes the story more real. So many people who dislike history do so, they will always say because they had poor teachers in school. I was lucky enough to have very good history teachers in school who were able to bring things to life for me. And I think that names and dates, names and dates stereotype is what turns people off. And being in a museum like say the Hancock Clark House where we're hearing not from John Hancock's perspective, he didn't write anything about what he did that day, but his wife did. Um, and she was the one who was actively being interviewed about it later on in life. And her side of the story is not battle centric. Uh, it's the emotions of the day and what she felt as a normal person getting caught up in something like this. Uh, similarly at the Monroe Tavern, um, we have Anna Monroe's story as a child in the tavern and a different perspective and what it was like growing up sort of in the shadow of the revolution. Um, the events of the day that are being portrayed by the men of the town are very clinical because they were for a specific purpose of explaining exactly what happened minute by minute um, for sort of political legal reasons. Um, and the women are the ones that are giving that extra context so that we know what living through this was actually like. And so I, I really appreciate being able to bring those stories to the forefront because I think it, it allows people to see these historical figures as real people and not just as names and dates. One thing that will change and that Lexi is so incredibly proud of as a broad team of now hundreds of people um, who've come together to have a new monument here in the birthplace of American liberty and as you said, but the monument, Meredith Bergman as a sculptor, when she visited Lexington Historical Society and went through that exhibit of Bold Women of Lexington, Something Must Be Done, she was struck by the spinning protest and other stories that are told in the exhibit. And so the monument she's designed is literally the foundation at the plaza, this round granite plaza on the ground, in the shape of a spinning wheel that will be engraved to look from above like a spinning wheel. And then she has as one of the four central figures, a woman who is inspired by Anna Harrington and those other women who are anonymous with a spinning wheel in the design. And then over the central arch, there's another spinning wheel. It was that important a theme for her to bring it forward in this artwork. So as people come back to visit Lexington, they will now see right when they get off the tour bus, um, they can actually see a permanent reminder that women were in Lexington, they did take action, they were an important part of the community. And so Lexi here will continue doing this event each year and we invite people to get involved. This is not, this is the, Lexi here is the opposite of a little small group. This is a very open circle where people can sign up and get involved join our research team. We are still raising money to, con to complete the building of the monument and we welcome contributions of any amount. Um, we also have our communication team sharing out these stories and promoting our living her story.
that might engage of, of any age. Um, and that means you can help volunteer a person who helps interpret the stories, or you can come to other events like the spinning tableau and participate or be part of it or be an observer, whatever is more comfortable for you. So we're very excited by today. We will be wrapping up shortly and just wanna make sure if anyone has any questions or comments, you are welcome to share them here or you can email us at lexmonument at gmail.com. I also have this other surprise, but time will be too short. Uh, Stacy Frazier, who helped curate the exhibit, Something Must Be Done, met with me because she's not available at this time slot, um, but I will post, Lexi here will post that video online. So if you go to either our Facebook page, our website, or Instagram, looking for Lexi here, you can hear more information about the inspiration that was that the way the spinning event turned into part of the exhibit that is at Buckman Tavern. And again, just wanna close out by thanking you, Sarah, so much for your leadership in 2019, for your ongoing partnership through the society with Lexi here. Everyone's muted, but everyone is giving a big applause. I will give thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm so excited to have these things, you know, in conjunction. And I, I don't think I've said it on camera before, but you've heard me you know, say this probably a dozen times right now, what I really love about the monument is that it's in conversation with Captain Parker because the spinning bee couldn't have happened without him in the same way that the revolution couldn't have happened without women. And so I, I appreciate that. Again, it's that community conversation that reminds us that no man and no woman is an island. We all have to work together if we want to have a revolution. Um, and so, it's something that we have to, I think, in the future, be very conscientious of explaining to the public um, in continually sharing these stories and, and letting them know just how much effort it took to get to April 19th um, and that it really was uh, the entire town of Lexington uh, that was formulating these ideas. Um, the, the battle was a very important flashpoint, but there was so much behind it that doesn't get talked about. It's completely true. And it's as we go into the 250th, it's why we're committing to continuing to do the spinning tableau, because we can't do it once in 2019. People, if they missed it that day, they missed it. We need to keep doing it and letting our friends know, hey, go visit this because when you see something, it's part of, and we haven't really focused on this for today's talk, future talks, part of why we're having the tableau is because for the people who stand in the tableau and participate, the story becomes really just part of their lived experience, even though it's taking place in 2022 or next year in 2023. Um, Lisa, I did see your hand go up and I'm gonna see if we can unmute you. Go ahead. Um, I just unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Jesse. Thank you, Sarah. Um, question, um, hopefully you have time for this. The reaction, the reaction to this, I'm really kind of curious as this um, event um, wrapped up and these women went back to their, um, to their, to their homes. And again, it, it was a patriarchal society, um, I'm assuming. Um, and what was the reaction um, in terms of, um, I mean, men weren't at this event. Um, well, maybe they were walking by and, and people were checking them out, but it's, I'm just kind of curious, what was the reaction to this? Um, was it okay? Was it, um, you know, was it applauded? Was it, was it uh, something that was dismissed? Was it something that um, was discouraged or were they embarrassed? I mean, I'm just kind of curious. Do you have any information on that? A lot of that has to be speculation, but I think Lexington was a radical enough community that everyone would have really been behind it. Um, and the men were also very much benefiting from these types of protests as well. Um, and so it was probably a man who wrote that newspaper article. Um, you know, men had voting power. Um, and they had more traditional forms of protest. This was one of the few ways that women were able to do something, but it did really mean a lot to people. And I think there were definitely folks who were using that as a means to say, look how much the women are sacrificing, you should too. Um, so they were very much um, in that newspaper article encouraging other 
towns to do so and to say, you may not think this means anything, but it's it's really an example of kind of weaponized femininity from the 18th century saying the Bible tells women that we have to spin and clothe our husbands. And we are just doing what the Bible tells us to do, but doing it politically. Um, and there were certainly people who were saying that women being able to produce these things to physically support the boycotts, to not just say we're not going to buy anything, but to be able to put our noses to the grindstone and actually create the things that we're boycotting on our own so we're not all starving and freezing to death. That means a lot. So there were people saying that, you know, women meant just as much as soldiers in the revolution. Um, my favorite article, which I suspect was written by a woman, although it's hard to tell, um, was essentially blaming men for putting us in this position in the first place and saying we call women frivolous and saying that all they care about are feathers and ribbons. But who made them do that in the first place? If they don't wear feathers and ribbons, then we don't give them the time of day. So whose fault is that? Um, if men weren't so picky about their women, then maybe we wouldn't be in this situation in the first place. So it was definitely being talked about more so than we think. Again, our the history that we learn tends to be so, um, not sanitized, but so condensed that we don't learn very much about differing opinions and um, about the nuances that people felt about these things back then. Perfect. But to make a long story short, I think people were very supportive. <laughs> And I think we'll we'll close on the note that uh, in coming you. talks, we will we will take that question up because I would definitely say there's never been a time in history when women who were bold weren't mocked and ridiculed. So I agree with Sarah on many of those points. But in future conversations, we can talk about why did that newspaper article say some may call them ludicrous. So it it let's let this conversation continue. We are so grateful to be able to have the conversation in the first place. So Sarah, thank you so much. We give you our three huzzahs as the participants in the tableau did. Um, we wish everyone a very happy and productive and bold spinning anniversary day from Lexington, Massachusetts. And thank you so much to Cary Library and the foundation for making today's speaker series event possible. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a wonderful day.